burned a little bit, but... timber work to begin with, but he was always playing around, there was a creek there, he was always playing around with water, and he knew there was, he should be able to figure it out, so he made water wheels out of wood, and he made some out of tin, you know, and then he realized, you know, he had to make it out of iron, so he came to Sutter Creek, and he partnered, went into partners, this was actually in 1870, it was called Campbell and Hall, okay, and so he, he worked here for about three years, and in 1873, he bought it out, bought them out, and changed the name and found it. So this is one of his big claim to fame is the night water wheel. Okay. So you guys Thank know you. what a foundry does. Okay. Back to the basics. This foundry only used junk iron, any kind. It didn't matter. They would melt down an old refrigerator if you, they had one. They would melt it down. They would make a, a pattern out of wood, okay? They, they made a pattern out of wood for this. And then they would put it in a sand clay mixture, and you'll see all this as you go through. Then they would open that up, and they would take that wooden pattern out, close it back up, and that left the cavity of whatever shape that pattern was. They'd poke a hole in the top, and they would pour molten iron, okay? And then they would go home. They only poured on Friday. They would go home, they'd come back on Monday, open up all of the castings, and start machining them, start the whole process. So during the week, they made patterns, they cleaned machinery, and they made the castings, and then on Fridays they poured. That was the big pour day. So Samuel Knight was able to, he's the only one that has been able to pour a water wheel. There's all kinds of different water wheels. I mean, everybody and their brother has invented a water wheel or, or improved upon it. Well, he's the only one that port was able to pour it in one content, one pour. All of the other ones, each one of these is a separate casting, and then they're bolted on to the main wheel. That's what made him. This is this is hard to do. We we have recreated this, but nobody else was able to re to, to do it. Um, it was. A lot less labor intensive because making each one of those castings for each cup and you know they just and then having to drill the holes and bolt them on so it was really really tough so believe it or not Samuel Knight in the late 1800s he put together a catalog he had eight or nine different patents on different things that he invented and you'll see them as you go through um, so he sent that that catalog all over the world. So we've had people that have come here from India, there's water wheels. There's still water wheels. Well, actually there was a couple here from Iceland a couple years ago, and they came here because they heard that we had opened it up again. They have a water wheel in their little town that's been generating electricity for over a hundred years. Wow. It's still generating electricity today. Wow. So. This foundry is now 150 years old. So, okay, let's go on. You want it. Put in the pipe. Get that rivet red hot. Stick a bar, a hammer inside here. Pound it down flat, and that's what made the pipe. Before they started doing that, all the pipe up in the Sierras and everywhere was redwood. They would make a redwood pipe. They would wrap it with either a wire or a piece of tin. And once they added the water to it, it would swell up, and it would be watertight. And there's still a lot of redwood pipe up in Boy Scout camps. There's water wheels up in the Sierras and Boy Scout camps, and they're still running. The nicotine off of the walls and wash them down. Oh, it was, we couldn't wait. I mean, 150 years of smoking, and so it was pretty, quite a mess. All right. Most of the stuff that you see here is 150 years old. Wow. Okay. Come on in, make your way. 
when the, the, 19, uh, the 1936 fire, we lost a lot of the drawings and a lot of the, the history, but we have everything from 36. So how many people have been to Old Town Sacramento? Well, in Old Town Sacramento, when you go through Old Town, you're going to see a lot of buildings with a lot of filigree, a lot of fancy, and people think it's either carved out of wood or it's plaster. It was made right here at Night Foundry. This is actually the pattern, the wooden pattern, for these posts right here. Wow. Okay. And then the other one, the lighter colored one, that's this building right here. So all of this stuff they made here. All kinds of, you can see all this fancy stuff here. Every one of these pieces have to be made out of wood first, yeah. carved out of wood, and then poured in iron. And they would make, this is where they used to tie their horses to. Oh, cool. That would go on top of post. The cowboy would throw the rope over that. So, I'm going to let you guys, you all have your phones. If you have any problems with them, uh, what? there's little videos. I yeah. think there's 19 videos, so you don't have to really do any kind of reading. I will come back in in about 15 minutes and turn, the, turn everything on for you. Cool. Of course, cool. they would make a bunch of them, pipe fittings, and he would stock them here. So if you had something, you can come here and, and get it. The other thing is if you if something was broken, say you had a, a farm equipment and you snapped a couple of teeth off of the gear, well, you could bring it here, okay? The pattern maker could bring it is one of the first things that they built. And we didn't do anything to it. I just, and it's a hundred years old. Not a lot of stuff. Amazing. Yeah, and we actually use all of these cranes to move. They actually just use this as a storage place for his family when the developer bought it. For like 20 some years, he just used it as a storage facility. There was junk boats, there was two truck bodies in here, and just you couldn't walk anywhere in here. It was, it was a mess. So we had guys, and we had a couple of carpenters that rebuilt all of the windows. And believe it or not, we were lucky enough to find a barn in El Dorado Hills that was full of old double hung windows. And so we went and picked them all up, brought them back, took all the glass out and use all the glass, so even the glass is great. You can't really see stuff that we've restored. Footer, and we have a 12-footer um, that's in another building. And we've actually, I'll, I'll actually get this one running for you. Okay, right here, believe it or not, is early 1870s. On the second Saturday, we're actually making nuts and bolts. And I mean, it still works perfect. It takes about five passes, though, to make this because it's, it, you kind of have to baby it. It's kind of a little wore out, but you get around that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only electric lathe in the shop where the process is going to get. And it's about 1830 something. So we're going to leave that because it's actually pretty good. 
Two inch night water wheel. Okay, we've completely restored this, uh, put new babbit bearings in it. This water wheel generated about the same amount of horsepower as a 19, uh, 1960 Volkswagen, <laughs> about 35 horsepower. But it ran everything in this shop until they started adding more equipment. As they added more equipment, we have nine water motors throughout the facility now. Um, so everything, when I turn this on, I have a 10 power electric motor that's connected to the main jack shaft. This main shaft right here over goes all the way and originally it went across the street into the blacksmith shop and it powered a power hammer in the blacksmith shop, okay? Wow. So if you guys, I'm gonna turn this stuff on if you wanna, Okay. Make sure your hands are in your pockets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Clear. Now look up. Now when this is run with the water, it's actually quieter than it is right now. What you're hearing is that electric motor is making the water. The water, once it got going, you hardly heard it at all. Okay.
people call them uh, hit blades, some people call them plate blades. Basically, they call them pit blades because they all have holes in front of them so that they can adjust you know, these things that are actually going to the ground. So, this is the pattern. Okay, so the pattern maker made this pattern. 99% of the patterns are made out of ponderosa pine. Really soft wood, so it's easy to make. So the pattern maker made this gear, took it over to the foundry, and the foundry made a casting, and they poured it. Okay? So when they poured it, this is the, this is the gear that came out of that pattern right here. So we mount that on here. Now I can clean up the base. I can make whatever diameter I want inside here. Catch it. So this one, same switch. One more to move it over. You've got to be real careful with these things. So I can change the speed just by changing the point. I can even reverse it if I want to go the opposite direction. I just take the twist out of that belt and it goes the opposite direction. So every time it makes one turn with revolution, the machine has to be here to make one foot. So you can imagine standing here all day. It didn't take them too long to realize that there's got to be a better way. So what he figured out was he came over here, he drilled two holes on the end of this shaft. He put in these two cans. We made this bar, we attached it to this cable, in from here, and we connect it to this handle right here. So now every time it makes one revolution, it clicks this handle right here. So now we can walk and do another job and back to this one. It's probably one of the first real goals. If you change speeds, just put it in a different hole. Guys, we're pretty, pretty So everything stays turning all day long. We only do it on the second Saturday. Fourth Saturday, I turn it on. You know, the second Saturday, we have doses that are actually They're called cupolas. This is the one that was in the 1990s. This is the one that they used. Um, as you can see, it's pretty much gone. We have to completely rebuild it. This one here, the smaller one, nobody knows when it was used the last time. So we actually opened it up. It's got a door in the bottom, and it's open. It goes about 10 feet up above. So we climbed up inside of there and we took out all of the fire brick. It's all lined with two layers of fire brick. And it was all old and prepped. So we took all the fire brick out, we glued new fire brick inside, and this is the one that we use to pour on. We only pour three times a year. We only do it for not other nonprofits. We did uh, a pour for two pours for the Northern Nevada Railroad in Eli, Nevada, we did the bay where we're storing an 1870 steam engine, and we did boiler grates okay, uh, for them, and then we did uh, we did some work for the 
in Jamestown, the railroad there. Uh, we've done a couple other nonprofits, but we're not in competition, and we really only do this just to keep the art alive, really. So we do it about three times a year. They used to do it with four guys, okay? It takes us 15 guys, <laughs> and it's all day. Wow. It's, it's really a huge process. We pour aluminum in this little furnace here often. Every four day on the second Saturday, we're pouring stuff. We make stuff for the gift shop, as you saw. Uh, this here, we, we do some for ourselves, but mostly it's for other nonprofits. So the process is you start a fire in the bottom. Well, before you start a fire, they used to stack wood in there with their fire. We use a propane torch. You get up on that platform and you stage uh, coke, which is a piece of coal that has been burned at a low temperature. You cook it for a couple of days and it burns off all the impurities and you end up with almost a pure carbon. I have a piece here. Almost a pure carbon. Now, when you take the pure carbon, you can feel that how light it is, mm -hmm. and you add oxygen to that, you could get this up to over 3,000 degrees. We try to pour between 25 and 2,800 degrees. Uh, I mean, your, your iron just turns to wood. So, the process is you put 35 shovelfuls of coke, 450 pounds of iron. Okay, we break up whatever iron. You can see there's a pile of junk out there that we use. Then you put another 35 shovelfuls, 450 pounds of iron, 35 shovelfuls of coat, and once you fire this up, you look into this little eye hole there. You look into this little hole, you've got, that is plugged with a clay dam, okay? As soon as you see iron dripping down, through the coat, you got to get ready. When, you, when it gets up to about this level here, you take one of those spears, you poke a hole in there, and you fill up. This is the smallest ladle we have. This is about 100 pounds. The whole floor is covered with castings, okay, and molds. The whole floor, because you want, we will not even fire this up without uh, a ton and a half of iron that we need to pour. So you calculate how much iron you're going to need, and then we add about 20% just to be sure. So you poke a hole in that, you fill that up, the crane operator lifts it up, swings it around. Let me show you this. So this is the this is what the floor looks like. Okay, it's completely covered with castings. Wow. Okay. The whole floor. So you take, you swing this ladle around, and you start pouring at each one of these. Now, when you, when you pour, and you'll see it in the video, all of these things release gas, gases. Now, you got to make sure that that gas catches on fire when you pour. So there's one of the guys, if they, they normally almost always catch fire. But if they don't, you've got to fire them off, because the gas will lay down on the floor and if it gets thick enough it could explode oh, wow. so that's why you want them to burn off in the summer when we pour in here last summer we did a pour in, in june i believe it was it was 131 degrees in here wow in january we poured and it was 110 and it was like 40 <laughs> degrees outside so once you fill the ladle up and move, you take another spear and you have clay packed around the end of that spear and you jam it in there because it starts filling up again. You've got 10 minutes from the time you pour, you've got to be back here because you don't want to. There's actually an open trap in the back. If it gets too high, it starts dripping out the back. Okay? So, and the other reason you want to be back in 10 minutes is if you have something that's big, we, we poured some, uh, they're called molar wheels, and they're to crush, crush uh, gravel and clay. Anyway, they weigh 4,000 pounds each. So if you're doing something like that, you've only got 10 minutes to pour, get back, 
and get back with another pour or else they will not flow together and then you get a weak point. And that's that's kind of the that's the whole process basically.